Hi, it's Tear Down Tuesday again. Got something a little bit different. It's one of these broad electric toothbrushes. I use them, I love them, they're fantastic. Can't do without my electric toothbrush. And you've seen them, it sits on one of these chargers, wireless uh, power transfer to charge the internal battery. So I thought this one uh, crapped itself, I think it at least needs a new battery. So I thought we crack it open and check it out. Not only what's inside here, but what's inside the charger as well. Let's take a look. Could be interesting. Now, here's the charger part of it. This one's uh, specifically uh, 220 to 240 volts, so it's not the universal type. This is model number 4729, made in Germany. Hello to all my German viewers. Beauty, I know you love it. And uh, it got uh, two watts, 50, 60 hertz only, and uh, it doesn't look like this sucker is going to be easy to open. It looks like it's uh, maybe uh, you know heat sealed around the edges or something like that. So uh, before I uh, really uh, crack this thing open and see what's inside, I thought we'd um, just uh, run a simple uh, test on it to see what we're getting out of the coil here because the coil sticks up in this part like this. So when the toothbrush mates in there like that, it just, whoop, it just sits in the bottom and that gets proper coupling from coil to coil because um, you need proper coupling for these wireless power transfer systems to be anywhere near efficient. They're still going to be probably horribly uh, inefficient, but um, I expect this thing not to be operating at 50 hertz, of course, it'll be operating at a much higher frequency because there's no way you're going to get a loose coupling like that working at 50 hertz in these sort of sizes. It's just not doable. So it's probably working at a couple of hundred kilohertz or uh, something like that, perhaps. So maybe this is even potted inside. I don't know if we'll even be able to see the electronics in here. So um, I don't know, I might have to get the Dremel and take that sucker apart. But uh, anyway, I thought we'd uh, hook on and see what we're getting out of this coil. Now, how do you do that? Well, um, we, unless you have a matching coil to sit on there, there's a very simple thing you can do. With your crow probe, crow stands for cathode ray oscilloscope, it's an Australian term, sorry. Um, old habits, I keep using it. The oscilloscope probe or scope probe, you can actually form a little transformer with it, a single loop like that. And that can be used for RF uh, pickup, for high frequency um, pickup. It's, it's pretty horrible and uh, very inefficient, but it does actually work. It acts as a single turn and it does actually work at high frequency. So let's uh, just put that over here. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely uh, horrible. In fact, actually, I'm not even going to bother because I know it's not going to work at the couple of hundred kilohertz we've got here. So what can we do? Simple. We can use our ground lead and wrap that a couple of times around like that and that will give us better coupling. And if we go up here and take a look at the oscilloscope, let's see what we get. Aha! Uh -huh. We have something Let's have a look. What have we got here? We've got, let's center that, expand it out, and bingo. Yep, ah oh, no, I was way off on the couple of hundred kilohertz. I was off by an order of magnitude. It's only 20 kilohertz. There you go. And it's, uh, you know, around 700 millivolts peak to peak. The absolute, the uh, voltage, of course, um, it doesn't really matter because it's just what's being picked up by our coil, but there you go. That's roughly sinusoidal. There's a little bit of something happening on the top there. I'm not sure what, but uh, there you go. That's 22 odd kilohertz. All right, so you'll notice that uh, with three turns of my scope uh, ground lead on there, I'm getting about 250 millivolts uh, RMS on there. And if I remove one loop there, let's, let's have a look. There you go, it drops down, and if you remove another one, it drops down again. But actually, surprisingly, we are still picking up 20 kilohertz there with just the single, the single loop like that is just enough, very loosely coupled, like that is just enough to pick up that signal. All right, so what we'll do is we'll just clean that up with some average in a bit. So we'll go into our choir menu, we'll just turn on... Uh, some average in there. 
Let's do more than two averages. Let's say take it up to eight averages. There we go. We've cleaned up our waveform a little bit. Okay, what I'm going to do just to get consistent results, I'm going to sticky tape a just a single loop down on there like that so it's fairly consistent as you can see and uh, it won't change around if we wiggle our probe and play around with it like that. It's pretty steady like that and as you can see it's beautifully sinusoidal on the bottom like that. Almost perfect and then there's that distortion on the top there. Let's see what happens if we add a load by putting on the extra coil on there. Look at that. You can see the rising slope at the bottom there start to distort around about there. Look at that. As we load it down, the amplitude really isn't changing. It's staying the same. And then there's the peak. There's that little peak up the top which is changing a bit as we load that down. Now I'm not sure this actually doesn't uh, charge anymore so um, the lights don't come on so I'm not sure what's actually gone wrong in here. Maybe it's not actually the full load but uh, just the act of putting that coil on there does change that waveform, does distort it a little bit more. So you can see how it's certainly possible um, using this uh, poor man's um, inductive uh, pickup here to actually, um, you know, do some troubleshooting on these type of wireless uh, tra power transfer circuits. You can at least uh, play around and have some fun anyway. It's by no means uh, absolute uh, accurate, but it does allow you to couple into a system like this just using your scope ground lead. It's a really neat trick. Now, as for taking this sucker apart, it's uh, pretty trivial and it even provides instructions on the back here. It uh, shows you to put it on the stand like this and then give it a little bit of a twist and pop goes the weasel. There it is. Awesome. So let's, hey, look at that. Is our battery going to fall out? We've got a contact down in there. So let's take a, see if we can uh, get that out and take a closer look. Now you should be able to see inside there, it's actually got three wires coming off the coil down in there and you can see the coil just down in there. You can see the multiple wraps in the coil. You might be able to see it Yeah, a little bit better through there. There we go. But we've got two what look like little ferrite beads just sort of stuck in there, not doing anything. Um, I'm not sure what their purpose is. And there they are. I've taken them out and they just sat in there. There's just two of them sitting in there like that. I'm going to stick this back on the uh, scope up there and uh, see if there's any difference in the waveform. And I did stick it back on there and uh, trust me there was absolutely no difference whatsoever. I won't even bother showing it. So um, I'm not, I'm unsure how to actually get the rest of this stuff in here out. You can see the battery in there with the welded uh, contact terminal. That would be a uh, nickel metal hydride battery and it's sort of it's pushed all of this stuff. If I try and pull it out, it sort of pulls all this stuff with it. And that bar, the uh, the uh, vibration bar there doesn't um, slide through or anything like that. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> requires some more percussive maintenance, I think. When in doubt, just yank harder. <laughs> and here it is. It just uh, popped. It pulled out. Look at that. Um, I think I've, uh, yeah, I've busted uh, something there from these two things. Here's the, uh, here's the battery. There we go. What is it? A uh, 607M. Hey, it's Sanyo. Excellent. They've put a top quality Sanyo in there. Nickel metal hydride. There you go. So uh, technically that's replaceable, except I think I've uh, busted the whole show. So I'm not sure. Um, it's probably some sort of, you know, one-off uh, press fit type thing, I don't know, but I can't find any way to get the rest of the case open. So uh, to get a look at the motor and stuff, which would be up the top end, um, I'll have to crack that open. But we have some electronics. Beauty. And sorry, I was mistaken about the uh, number of wires coming out of there. It is actually uh, four. Three didn't make uh, sense, of course. So there's uh, two pairs coming out there. One of them is common in there on that terminal. So there's only three terminals on the board. All right, it's times 10 macro lens time, and this is going to be uh, 
really good. We should be able to uh, trace out these circuits. Look like looks like there's part readable part numbers on both of those chips. We'll get into and uh, not much uh, doing on the bottom there. Um, some test points, of course, and uh, a couple of tracks. So we should be able to trace this thing. Actually, reverse engineer it pretty easily. It's a 668-331-7415-00R8. Well, doesn't ring a bell. Might have to Google it. Well, this one uh, wasn't trivial to uh, find, and I think I've found it, possibly. Um, it, it all seems to uh, match, but you Google, uh, you know, 668-331 is really the only thing that you get, and it turns out that's an EM. Look, it's in the exact package you want. Uh, TSOP. I'm got on on one of these um Alibaba, you know, one of these uh, Chinese uh, broker uh, websites, and it's a TSOP 14 package, exactly what we got. And that's presumably that's obviously the manufacturer. So you Google EM 668 3331, and you end up popping over to uh, various sites, but you get on to a company called EM. Microelectronics, um, and they're part of the Swatch Group. Go figure! And they claim that they're uh, leaders in ultra low power and low voltage uh, solutions, including microcontrollers. And as it turns out, if you go into their microcontroller section, they've got um, EM. Uh, let's have a look here in MCUs. Wait in, wait in. They've got EM. 6682 but they don't have a 6683 so go figure i don't know whether or not it's an older type i still i googled that and i still couldn't find it but who knows maybe it's a custom uh part specifically for brawn who knows but uh, you go take a look at it in the em6682 and it's a rather interesting thing i would have had uh no idea that these things are uh, even existed if i didn't open this toothbrush that's what teardowns can do it can lead you onto parts you search for them and it can lead you to manufacturers you didn't know about i didn't know about these little ultra low power eight pin microcontrollers i had no idea this company even existed but uh here you go they've got some uh looks like some uh novel ultra low power eight pin microcontrollers they work from uh low 0.9 volts um to 5.5 so that's pretty much uh, ideal for uh, single cell um, single cell operation like single cell alkaline because uh, really their um, energy uh, density uh, the energy usable energy in an alkaline battery for example pretty much exhausts itself at around about that 0.9 volts figure some people take it as 0.8 volts that's a more common thing but basically from a single alkaline cell you can use up um, all of the energy in say a AA alkaline battery for example with this microcontroller so that's really quite neat another interesting thing has got a 4-bit ADC or 12 levels of the supply voltage so obviously there's no built-in uh, reference by the uh, sounds of it. it just uses your uh, supply uh, voltage to do that but it's only got a 4-bit ADC which might be all you need and these things are I don't know they might be really uh, dirt cheap or something like that, but it's got a mask uh, ROM built in, so these are not flash devices. So you can expect these to be really uh, cheap because they don't have to have all the extra um, expense of making a die with uh, you know, flash memory, reprogrammable flash. They're a mask ROM device. Um, and they've probably got development kits to go along with it if you're, you know, that's why you've probably never heard of these because, well, you know, hobbyists and, uh, and uh, you know, professionals just working on your standard, you know, stuff off the shelf from DigiKey have no idea about these sort of things. And they're certainly probably not uh, easy to start developing with. And the core is an EM6600. That sounds like their own uh, core. It's probably based on some derivative of uh, something somewhere along the line who knows but anyway it's a complete uh, single chip solution uh, four microamps in uh, active mode the um, uh, built-in um, oscillator it's designed for ultra low power stuff it only goes from 32 kilohertz to 800 kilohertz the main oscillator it's got a watchdog uh, timer it's got a sleep controller 10-bit uh, universal counter timer some interrupts in there and a 4-bit ADC, so it's really, um, you know, a pretty specific uh, low-power sort of, you know, consumer microcontroller in these sort of consumer appliances, because you can bet your bottom dollar that Braun paid absolute lowest possible 
they shaved every cent, lowest possible cost off the price of this thing. And they would have ordered millions and millions of these parts to be used in these uh, toothbrushes. So uh, no wonder they picked uh, uh, possibly um, something like this. This company may have offered them the cheapest price with their mass ROM and their 800 kilohertz and no flash and you don't need anything fancy. There you go, typical applications, household appliances. <laughs> and if you go down further and take a look at the CPU, it's only a 4-bit CPU, there you go, they still make them. 4-bit processor, here's a classic example of one using your toothbrush. It doesn't need anything more, because this is an intelligent, in quote marks, uh, toothbrush. It, you know, has uh, timers in there and uh, and uh, stuff like that. So it, uh, you know, after a set time, it'll beep at you and stuff like that. It'll pulse the motor and uh, do, uh, you know, various intelligent things to tell you that, um, uh, you know, you've been brushing for, you know, three minutes, so it'll it'll vibrate the motor and actually warn you that, okay, you've been brushing for three minutes, don't, you know, overbrush or something like that. So it needs some intelligent control in there. That's why I'm pretty darn sure, even though our number on the chip is the 6683, I think we've actually got the controller here. It matches up in terms of the um, uh, package and the functionality it's, you know, exactly what I would expect. I would have expected a super cheap, low-end consumer microcontroller in this. And you don't get much more low-end than a built-in mask ROM and a 4-bit core. There you go. And it's uh, two uh, clock cycles per instruction, 74 instructions. Um, and <laughs> there you go. It's worth taking a look at this thing. And if we uh, go down to the bottom, if we take a look at this, it's uh, 2008. Copyright 2008, there we go, Rev D, and uh, package marking, there you go, EM6682, no, it doesn't mention anything to do with 6683, so there you go, these are uh, SOICs, but uh, I'm sure it can come in, no, there we go, 14 pin TSSOP, and uh, yeah, I mean, we do have um, those sort of numbers, we've got 00R8 on our um, package as well so who knows but uh, yeah I think we've definitely got the right device here and our other device here is a TSM 7401 with a mark in 7k4 once again not familiar gonna go have to look it up the uh, micro controller isn't going to be able to drive the motor directly so uh, let's go look that up and curiously when you're looking at these things you'll notice sometimes you really have to get the right angle of light on these chips to read them. As soon as you get that right angle, you know, bang, it just really stands out. But uh, sometimes if you don't get the right angle, you just cannot read these things at all. And they appear just as a, you know, a completely black uh, surface. You can't read anything at all. It's all about the light and the angle. Well, there's nothing complicated happening there at all. It's just an ordinary N-channel MOSFET in an SO8 package from uh, Taiwan Semiconductor. It's uh, only a 20-volt job at uh, you know, four and a half amps. Not much doing there at all. Uh, you could have used uh, any one of a uh, countless number of um, N-channel MOSFETs on the market. So uh, clearly it's just a, you know, as you'd expect, a standard uh, DC motor, and they're just hooking that directly across the battery and turn it off and on with the MOSFET. That's it. Now let's have a look at what else we've got on the board. We've got a tact switch, obviously, which goes through to the button on the front of the thing to switch it on and off. And uh, got a few passives, a couple of uh, diodes here in a uh, MELF uh, package, and uh, which you don't uh, see too much these days, and a couple of uh, SOT 23s there, which are or like might be uh, transistors or uh, maybe even uh, diodes or uh, or something like that. So maybe even a regulator perhaps. So um, and we've got a couple of LEDs here, two of them that uh, match up different colours that uh, match up to the uh, light pipe or the um, or the uh, cover on the front, the uh, clear cover where they shine directly through there and. That's it, there's not much happening at all. We'll have to trace the circuit out, it uh, shouldn't be too hard. Now let's have a quick look at the input circuitry here, and you can see it's got two coils here with one common. Why they've got two coils, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine if you're into wireless power transfer technology and stuff like that. Maybe the increases, you know, the, the coupling coefficient between the coils or something like that. These things are fairly 
uh, critical when you design these power coupling uh, systems like this. You know, just uh, the physical uh, aspects of how they're wound, how they're mounted, the physical spacing of the coupling, the rotation, and all that sort of stuff can really matter. So it would have been engineered precisely to give a particular output voltage here on the rail. So basically we've got a rectifier on uh, each part there. This is obviously a uh, charging lead here which comes from the microcontroller and uh, we've got another diode here and we've got a, um, a filter cap. So we're going to generate a DC voltage here on our rails. Okay I've got my probe hooked up to the power rail there and as you can see we're getting 4.53 volts. There's a bit of uh, bit of noise on there but it's uh, not a big deal you'll find that will be the uh, 20 kilohertz uh, switching frequency and we'll take a look at that in a minute and if I wiggle that around a little bit just back and forth there's really no change there but if I start to lift it up you'll notice the voltage you can see the voltage dropping got the DVM feature here and uh, you'll notice that voltage drops as I lift that up but I don't have to lift that up much only a like a millimeter you can visually start to see that voltage drop and it's practically oh, I'm not going to say it's linear but it's almost a linear relationship between the uh, height and the voltage there there you go not not quite you'll see you might notice that the LED actually flashed there when we got to a point it's probably not going to do it probably a bit of hysteresis there there we go if you saw that there we go the LED it's just fractionally switching on when it transitions through that voltage there and if we probe one of the coils there check it out that's the waveform we get and it's about 13 just over 13 volts peak to peak there and if we freeze that you can see you can see this ringing on the rising edge there and associated ringing on the lower edge with a flat top and a flatter bottom now as opposed to what we were getting when it was unloaded and a bit more interesting is if we probe the other channel look at what we get there we go they're inverse waveforms look at that I'll zoom in and give you a good look at that there you go, once again they're about uh, just uh, on 13 volts uh, peak to peak and we're talking, there's that uh, 21.8 kilohertz there, that's our switching frequency but you can see they've certainly flattened on the top um, this, uh, this channel here is uh, more rounded on the bottom than this one is but they're essentially inverse waveforms and if we have a look at the uh, ripple on our uh, four and a half volt rail here. You can see the uh, 22 kilohertz there. There it is 22 kilohertz, but of course you can see that second Rise there which uh, is due to the fact that we're a uh, full wave rectifying this thing from the second coil And if I actually cut one of those uh, coils off there as you can see it's not you know as there it is It's we don't have that second little rising there well maybe when it's uh, charging if it was charging the battery properly perhaps it might matter a bit more but I think maybe it's got something more to do with the just you know better coupling coefficients between the uh, coil perhaps when they're uh, do it you know when they've got larger charging currents maybe but I don't know it'd be interesting to see if, um, if we actually got full charge current on this thing and uh, as it turns out the pinout for our microcontroller by the way on the board doesn't actually match that uh, data sheet we saw so um, it's but I still think it is one of those uh, one of those devices though maybe a custom derivative for uh, Braun or something like that perhaps all right now let's hook up a new battery to this thing and uh, see what we get charging current wise let's give it a go hundred and there you go just over a hundred milliamps and you can see the charging LED flash there I'm going to rise lift this up whoa yeah you only lift it up a millimeter and you can really see that charge current instantly drop away to way to nothing like it's halfway up the stem 
there, the supporting stem, and it's, it's dropped away to nothing. It just doesn't kick in at all. Now let's have a look at what happens to our voltage rail up here, our 4.5 volt rail, when we hook up our battery. Let's give it a go. Whoa, it drops to just over 3 volts, and it drops dramatically down in frequency. We'll freeze that, and uh, what are we getting there? We're getting 800-odd uh, hertz. There you go. The switching frequency drops dramatically when we're drawing um, a 100 milliamps charging current from this thing. And that gives us another thing to check. What happens to our uh, the actual output waveform from the transformer? I've only got one side here of the transformer when we turn it into charging mode. Let's have a look. Oh, look at that. It's dropped. Looks like there's some... Hey, there's something, there's some pulse thing happening there. Let's try and capture that. There we go, look at that. There's these pulses in there that are... Uh, Look at, check that out. Look at that. Pulses at what interval? We're talking, you know, oh, a millisecond interval or thereabouts, just over. A millisecond, well, that did uh, correspond to our uh, 800 hertz that we were seeing before. And certainly, there it is. No surprise, that's the 800 hertz we were getting on the uh, 5 volt, well, it dropped down to 3.3 volt, the voltage rail um, after the rectification and filtering. So it's using some sort of, it's deliberately pulsing something. I'm not, yeah, you know, that would probably, it'd be on the charger um, side actually drawing, I would assume, from the charger side, drawing these pulses like that. Remarkable. And indeed, if we take a second channel and uh, measure the battery charging voltage and we freeze that we can see that the battery charging voltage look at that it's got ripple on it then it doesn't for that period where it jumps back to its original um original position so obviously it's doing some sort of pulse charging of the battery in here at 800 odd hertz so what we're actually seeing here is a pulse uh period charging period between here where we've got the ripple on uh, the uh, well the charge ripple on the battery and the amplitude of our uh, waveform from our transformer of course drops down due to the um, extra current being drawn from the uh, power coupling scheme there and then you have a period where it just uh, goes um, it, it switches off the charging during this period which is why you get a flat line on the battery because you're not measuring the charging ripple anymore, you've just got the flat battery voltage on there and our waveform returns to normal as we saw, which is the same waveform we saw before with the uh, no load, with the no uh, battery load on there. And if we have a look at the basic reverse engineered uh, circuit here, we've got the uh, dual coils over here, full wave rectified uh, by these two diodes and then it goes through another series diode here which generates our positive voltage rail uh, which you saw was uh, 4.2 volts or drops to like a 3.3 volts uh, during uh, charging but when it's in operation and there's no uh, power coupling through the coil here of course the voltage rail for the IC uh, the microcontroller is from the 1.2 2 volt rechargeable nickel metal hydride battery minus uh, the uh, diode drop here. So that's why we need a really ultra low voltage uh, microcontroller that can operate from anywhere, as we saw in the data sheet, from 0.9 volts all the way up to uh, 5 plus volts. So you need that entire span to have such uh, simplistic circuitry like this and powered from the single cell. Now, 
what we've got here is, uh, of course, the uh, motor is connected directly across the battery with the N channel MOSFET, goes directly to the IC control, and it can switch that off or on um, under intelligent control. And it is actually um, this particular toothbrush is the, like the top of the range professional model, and it um, does uh, things like actually uh, pulses the motor to after a certain time to let you know, you know, oh, you've been brushing your teeth long enough. So, you know, so it can do smart stuff like that because it's under uh, IC control like that. And it's very simple, just a standard end channel uh, switch there. And we've got a simple uh, RC filter here, which goes off, which allows the uh, that uh, four bit analog to digital uh, converter inside the um, microcontroller, or it might even be a, a you know, a uh, better resolution analog to digital converter, it allows it to measure the battery voltage during charging. Now, as for charging itself, it's very simplistic. We've got a switch up here. I don't know whether or not it's a, uh, uh, whether or not it's a MOSFET or it's a bipolar device. It's a little SOT23 package, and it basically um, directly, there doesn't seem to be any current limiting uh, in there, in series with it. It basically, it looks like it connects directly from the uh, four-way rectified um, voltage on the power coupling coil here straight through to the battery like that. So really, they're, they're relying on the, um, the maximum current available extracted from the power coupling coil is the maximum charging current for the battery. And as you saw, they actually pulse that uh, charging at around about 800 hertz or thereabouts. And uh, we've got some uh, filtering here, of course, for the uh, rail and uh, some reverse diode protection there. And the charging LED uh, over here, which it, you saw that, they flash it once every two seconds or whatever while it's charging. And that's basically all there is to one of these rechargeable toothbrushes. And as for the base unit, yeah, unfortunately I was right. I took off this uh, back thing here and you can see the potting compound in there. Really freaking annoying. So I'm <laughs> Afraid uh, we're not going to be able to see inside that one because I, quite frankly, couldn't be bothered. Actually, it's not that I couldn't be bothered. I've actually uh, run out of time for Tear Down Tuesday. I've got to head home and edit this video to make sure it's up on Tuesday. But uh, there you go. That is um, inside one of these electric toothbrushes. They're rather interesting. I hope you liked that uh, tear down. And if you want to discuss any of this, if you're into um, all this uh, power, uh, wireless power transfer technology and uh, stuff like that. There's a lot of uh, a lot of art involved in this sort of stuff. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. And remember, as always, if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give the video a big thumbs up. And we'll catch you next time.